All right, sorry about the technical difficulties there, everybody. Um, we're gonna go ahead and just get started here. Uh, just make sure you guys can all hear me. So uh, at the uh, end of this video, I will tell you right now that uh, we are gonna be sending out a recording to everyone. Um, so I'll remind you at the end too of that. Uh, just get started. Hello, my name is Joseph Capaletti. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, our webinar is gonna be talking about data logging. At the core of our products, we have many opportunities for observing, recording, and manipulating data. So we'll be reviewing some of the different techniques and practices that we support, as well as functionality for CFR 21 Part 11 compliances. After we have discussed some of the different practices, we'll also take some time to demonstrate our local data logging options. To give us an overview, our PLCs have several outlets for data storage. Information can be recorded or monitored locally on the PLC through data tables, data samplers, message composer, and our built-in alarms tools. Our no-code IIoT cloud solution on UniCloud has many features for storing and manipulating information that has been securely communicated by an internet-connected PLC. And we'll discuss the different protocols that can be used to communicate with third-party SCADA or IIoT systems such as Modbus, SQL, MQTT. We can also connect to or host an FTP server for sharing uh, records, records or recipes created and exported by the PLC. So to begin, we'll be talking about our data tables. They're very easy to define with their own set of function blocks available in the ladder's toolbox. Records can be exported from the PLC to the SD card, as well as imported from a CSV and Excel format. Users can view or edit the data through the PLC's Uni apps or the data table HMI element. Lastly, built into the data table's exporting functions, we can digitally sign to ensure that records have not been changed or tampered with after creation. Next, the data sampler is another tool available for monitoring multiple feeds of information, such as IO values or PLC tags. This data is recorded at a fixed interval directly onto the SD card where it can either be exported into a CSV format or graphed onto the HMI with a trend widget as shown here on your screen. The alarms function has integrated tools to notify machine operators of alarms and events through a set of built-in HMI displays. When the event or alarm is passed, the alarm name, ID, severity, and date time are all recorded to the PLC SD card and viewed on the alarm history screen. When the alarm log reaches 10,000 rows, a zipped file is automatically created and stored within the same SD card directory ready to be exported. Although it is typically communicated with external devices, by building your communication protocol, we can also met, uh, use Message Composer to create CSV files on the SD card. Once the message structure is created and built with live data, you can make an SV, S, sorry, CSV file for later reference or export. Additionally, our UniCloud was designed for transparent integration, crafted for securing encrypted communications to an easy to customize service, a Unitronic service that offers multiple formats of data visualization, aggregation, and analytics, as well as remote access to an application, HMI, and data. When adding IIoT capabilities, you are centralizing all of your data collection and management into a secure, accessible location to be analyzed or controlled. No cloud expertise is required to build your UniCloud environment. Your custom dashboards are built with drag and drop functionality that will even support multiple languages. If you are interested in this service, please visit unitronics.cloud for more information. MQTT, or Message Queuing Telemetry Transport, works off of a publishing 
subscription uh, structure with information disseminating from the publisher down to the subscribers through a broker over a TCP IP connection. So a publisher is sending messages according to topics to a specific brokers. The broker itself acts as a switchboard, accepting messages from publishers on specific topics and sending them to the subscribers of those topics. This is a common protocol for communicating with SCADA systems as well as IoT devices. And the unit stream can act as both the publisher or subscriber. However, a third party broker will still need to be established. Structured query language or SQL is an industry standard protocol for accessing and manipulating databases. The Unistream can act as a client to your SQL server where queries are built and executed via ladder function. In addition to the singular tag communication, the entire data table can be operating locally on the PLC, can also be connected to your SQL database. Modbus is one of the most common protocols being used today. It's an industry standard. We can communicate via both RTU and TCP networks. Created with a client server dynamic, the client device sends both data and requests to the connected servers. The Unistream can act as both the client and server and communicate. The communication is easily configured from the project rather than programmed. We have a simple periodic operation to read, write data, from two devices, as well as eight periodic commands, which can be triggered via ladder conditions. Although Modbus isn't a direct means for data logging, it is a common vehicle for transporting information between your field devices and your SCADA systems. Lastly, before we begin some demonstration, we'll discuss file transfer protocol or FTP. FTP is a communication protocol used for transferring files from a server to a client over an ethernet communication. Data tables, sampler logs, PDFs, CSV files can be shared between devices over the FTP network. Since the Unistream can act as either a client or a server, you can build your application to log your data directly to your third party FTP server, or alternatively, you can use a third party FTP client to connect your PLC SD card where the logs have been stored. So as we discussed, I'm going to do some demonstration here showing the local data logging options with our data tables as well as our data sampling. So we've got a few things mixed up right now with this. So get back on track. Just going to create a new project here. So we're going to be building a data table that will be collecting a name, an integer, and also recording a time that the values were entered onto the data table. We're going to try reading this information back onto PLC tags where we can interact with it and use it in our ladder or programming. And we're also going to give options for exporting and importing this data table to and from the SD card. So to begin, I'm going to import one of our UDFBs that are from our sample applications, which can be found under the Help tab in Unilogic. Download sample apps, and that will begin the download process. I've already imported this or downloaded this, so I'm just going to go into my UDFB folder from that download. Perhaps I'm in the wrong area.
This RTC to ASCII UDFB is going to be used to read the PLC's real time clock and convert its value into a string. We're going to have different options in the formatting here between the day, month, year, the hours, minutes, seconds. And we're going to have a few more options here for how it's going to be displayed in our project or in our reports. All right, so the UDFB has been imported. I'm gonna go back to our main routine. And before we begin any other ladder, I'm going to define a struct. Structs are gonna be how we're going to structure our information. It's also gonna provide our column structure for our data tables. Also giving us a fast lane to creating our global tag instances for our data. So I'm in the structs tab down below, I'm going to add a struct. I'll call this our table log. I'm going to add in some members. These members are the different data types that are going to be committed to this struct type. So the first one I'm going to choose is a ASCII string. This will be a name. And I'll give this a maximum string length of 15. I'm going to add in a new tag now. This is going to be an integer. And we'll just call this the number. And lastly, we're going to add in the timestamp. This will be another ASCII string. I'll give it the same length of 15 characters. I'll select Save. So now our project has a struct, but there are no global instances of this struct nor is there a table defined with these members. So to get the table defined first, we'll go to the tables here in the Solution Explorer, and we'll add a new table. Once it's open, we can see that there are no columns that are created, there are no rows. That's all defined here in the Properties window here on the right side. We can choose the struct that we just created, table log, under the struct uh, setting. Now that's created, we have the column structure that we're looking for. Last thing we're going to need is to create a number of rows because the default is one. I'm going to increase this to 10. We're going to keep this at a data table index. Data table index is going to give us the most flexibility. Um, the FIFO tables, the, the, the LIFO tables, they can all be performed through the data table index. Um, so I do recommend that if you are more familiar with the index and uh, there, there are different techniques that we can use to build this into a FIFO table in the future. Um, we just have a little, little more flexibility in the ladder for programming. So we have a data table created. I'm going to go back to our HMI to start structuring our data entry. If I go back to my global tags down below, I can see that there is a table struct now created. This is going to be information on the table itself, its current status, and the number of rows that have information entered. This still is not a struct instance from what we've created. So I'm going to create that right now by going to the Add New tag under the Global tab. Go down to the very bottom to find the table log. I'm going to call this our user entry and select save. Now here in the HMI, we're going to be able to view the data table and also enter in new information that will be recorded. So first, I'm going to select one of our text elements, the text box. I'm going to uncheck the read only, and I'm going to select the user entry name tag. This is going to be where the user is going to enter in the name of whoever is accessing this data ta uh, table and entering new information. Next, we're going to use a number element or numeric box. Place that directly underneath. 
Yet again, I'm going to uncheck the read only box down below. And I'm going to use the struct user entry number tag. The last piece I want to hear is a way to let the PLC know that we are ready to enter this information and log it to our data table. So I'm going to add in a button directly below. I'm going to give it an action. So we're going to set a brand new bit. So we'll select the create tag here. And this will be our add row. I'm sorry, we'll do the, uh, the right row. Next up in the properties, we'll go to the text label. Give us a new label. We'll say it's right row. And while we're here, we're going to add in the data table. Make it nice and big and visible. We'll select the data table that we've defined. You can see the columns populate with the name, number, and timestamp here on the top of the properties window. And I'm going to check the box here for read only. Now we can move over to the ladder again. And first thing I want to do is use our RTC to ask the UDFB and store our current date time into our global instance of our struct, the user entry entry. I'll drag and drop RTC. Oops. Drag and drop RTC onto my ladder. This is gonna be the format that it's offering us here in the top top, top comment section. I'm going to go with number two, hours, minutes, a.m., p.m. So I'll enter in number two into this first parameter. And now I need to choose the destination for this string. Once again, the user entry timestamp. So now every scan, the PLC is going to take the RTC time on the PLC, turn it into a string, and store that string into our global struct member here, the user entry. Now we're going to grab a direct contact and link this to our button that's on our HMI, the right row button. And scroll down till we find our data tables indexed. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna write our row to our DTI. We'll drag and drop that next to that. And the parameters here are going to give us some information on what each value should represent. The first one is which table is going to be receiving the information that we're selecting right now. The second is going to be which struct we're going to be using as the source of our data. So this is the destination table, and this is the source struct. That's going to be our user entry, that instance of our struct. And now we just select the row number. I plan on this value starting at zero and incrementing to the top or the bottom of this indexed data table and then returning back to zero if it goes over. So I'm going to assign a tag. I'll call this our row index. And I'll select save. Now, before I reset this, I want to increment this row index since it's starting from zero, so it's ready for our next entry. So I will go to our math, I'll grab the increment, and I'll select our row index. Now I can reset the row button bit with a reset coil. So far, this would be able to write information to our data table. But I just want to make sure I have ladder to consider whether or not this row index value is going to increment higher than the value of 10. Just because our data table's maximum index is going to be 9, starting from 0. 
So I'll go to my next rung and I'll use a comparison function block greater than or equal to. I'll link this to our row index. And I'll use the logic of whether or not row index is greater than or equal to the value of 10. Then I'm going to reset that value back to zero with the reset numeric function block. Link it to row index. Now, just so we can see this in action on our PLC, I'm just going to enable a VNC connection. And I'm going to start the download process. Okay, the download has completed. Here we have the PLC's HMI up on the screen. I'm just gonna enter in my name. And I'm gonna enter in a random number. When I select right row, we can see that value is placed directly into the first index row of our data table, including a timestamp. The RTC time here on the PLC appears to be uh, incorrect. But as I continue to add these values, that row index, as we can see here in the online mode, is gonna increment and allow us to keep adding information. So now that we have a means to write information to our data table and log these values, we're gonna need a means to actually manipulate it, read it, and actually interpret some of these values. So we're gonna start adding in some of our read row functions and elements. It's gonna look very similar to what's above. I'm gonna grab a text box, number one. And I wanna link this to another instance of our struct. So I add the user entry instance, I'm gonna create a read row instance. Of our table log struct. So back in the properties for this HMI element, I am going to keep the read only box checked because our, we are not gonna be editing this value whatsoever. The tag link down below, we're going to select the read row and the name. Next, we're gonna add in the number box or numeric box. Below that. Going to link this to the read row struct member number. 
Next, I'm going to actually link the timestamp to another text box. So I'll expand this once again. Keep this with the read only, read row, and timestamp. Lastly, I want to be able to control which values are being read from the data table. So I'm going to add in another numeric box. And this will be our read row index. We're going to create this tag to choose which row number we're going to be reading from the data table. So I'll uncheck the read only. I'm going to create a new tag. Call this the read row index. And now I'm going to add a button that we'll use as a condition in our ladder to begin the data table index read row function. Change the text label on this to read row. And I'm going to set a bit in the actions called the read row button. So just to give this a little bit of an overview, we have our write row function up top here, with then name an integer. Every time we write a row, it's going to increment and include a timestamp for the time of that name and number entry. Down below, we're going to be choosing a row from the data table and selecting read row to populate these HMI elements with the data. Let's go back to our ladder. I'm going to grab another direct contact and link this to the read row button. I'm going to scroll down in the toolbox. And we're going to be looking for the read row from DTI. This first box, just like the write row, is going to include the data table or the source this time. So we're going to be choosing the table one. The row number that we want to actually read and store onto our PLC's global tags. And this is going to be defined by our read row index on our HMI. So we can choose which row we're going to be reading. Lastly, we're choosing an instance of our struct, our global instance of our struct as a target. And that's going to be the read row. All we need now is the reset coil. just to reset the read row button bit. So we did before, we're gonna do another download and take a look at it online.
All right, the download is complete. Reopen our VNC connection. So I'm going to enter a couple of rows of information here. Give it my name. A couple more numbers. And now down below, I'm going to select which row I'd like to read onto or into these tags. I'm gonna just choose index one. So this should populate with the 147, 12.39 PM. And there we have it. Now, just to get ambitious with our uh, programming here, we're going to add in some of our clear function buttons, as well as our export and import. So to do this, I'm just gonna add in three buttons onto the HMI. Of course, make sure our formatting is just right. I can live with that. This is gonna be our clear button. We use this to clear every value that's currently on the data table. This will be our export. and our import. Gonna add in actions to each of these now, creating a new bit with each one. This first one is gonna set the clear button bit. This next one, another action. This will set the export button bit. And lastly, we have the import. Perfect, so let's go back to our ladder. And we'll scroll down. Just as we were doing above, we're gonna grab the direct contact. I'm gonna link this to my clear button. I'm gonna go back down to my data table index. I'm gonna look for the clear DTI. We do have the option to clear just an individual row if we want to replace information in say a recipe. Uh, but for this sake, I want to clear the entire data table and prepare it for an import. So I will clear the DTI, select table one. And one thing I wanna do after I clear the data table is I wanna reset our row index. Just because if we've already entered four rows of data, we need to make sure that when we clear it, we're starting back at the top at index zero. So let's go ahead and add in a reset numeric. And this will be for our row index tag. And then we can reset the clear button with a reset coil. We're gonna go right into the export button. I got nervous I was in the uh, UDFB for a second. We're in good shape. All right, so we'll use the export button. And down back in our data tables index, we're gonna look for our store DTI to file. A lot of parameters in this one, we're gonna go one by one with it. First, we have the data table we would like to store onto our SD card. That will be our table one. Next, we have our starting row in the source file. This will also be our row zero. The target file name. I'm just going to give this a name of log file. The number of rows that we are going to be exporting. 
This is going to be the maximum number of rows that the table has, which is 10. We have the option to append the file or to overwrite it. Depending, it will just add our entries to the bottom of it if we wanted to continuously log this information and keep a full record of it. Typically, that would be the case in a situation like this, but I would just like to overwrite it. Now we can choose what we're going to be exporting. We can export the UDTF. This is going to be the Unitronics file format for our data tables. We can also export the CSV or a zip version of our CSV file. I'm going to choose a number one option to create all three. This will be our CSV file delimiter. We'll keep that as it is. And this will be to digitally sign our files. This was the uh, CERT 221. Oh man. This was our certification for our digital security. Um, so we give ourselves the ability to export these files, digitally sign it, and verify that our exported files have not been tampered with since the time of creation. So we'll choose that option right now. And all we'll need to do to actually verify that is go through our Unilogic tools, the digital signature verifier, to ensure that the file has not been tampered with or tampered with or changed since creation. Lastly, we have our status tag. I'll just call this our status one. And I'm going to reset the export button. Lastly, we're going to import the data table, whatever is on the SD card. So we'll grab another direct contact, place that in the next row below. And we're going to now load DTI from file. So we'll grab the load DTI from file. Oh, link this to our import button. Very similar to our last function block here, we're going to be selecting the data table that will be the target. Next, we're going to be the, choosing the starting row that is in the PLC data table. So locally on the data table, we're just going to be starting at row zero. Now we have the source file name. This matches what we entered up top here. That will be the log file. Next, we have the starting row in the source file. So the external file that we're going to be importing, we can choose a specific row that we would like to start on, which would be zero. And then the number of rows from the SD file that we would like to copy over, this would be 10. Another status uh, integer that we can link to see any sort of, or troubleshoot any sort of problems. I'm going to create a tag here. I'll call this our status two. And then I can reset the import button bit. Go ahead and download these project changes.
OK, so the download is finished. We'll connect. I'm going to start adding in some values into our data table. Now my name is Steve, so why not? So you hit the right row button there by mistake. Go back to being Joe for a second. Just going to test out this function here. I'm going to read row index one. Information is populating great. Now I'm going to export this data table to the SD card. So I'm going to select export. And just to confirm that this information has been exported, I'm going to clear the data table. Now all the information is no longer populating and I'm going to import. All of our information has come back, although all I have, we had to do was send it to the SD card, clear the data table, and now we're ready to read this information again. All right, so we're going to transition over to working with some of our data samplers from here. So if you are following along, we're going to save the project. I'm going to select the hardware configuration. All right, so as mentioned before, data sampling is gonna be a means to track values, inputs, tags, at a set interval that we determine in our or configure in our project. So first thing I wanna do is actually create sample data that we can actually monitor and trend. Let's go ahead and grab a direct contact. We're going to link this to our frequency tag, 100 milliseconds. And I'll change this over to a positive transition. And I'm going to increment an integer until it reaches 100. Once it reaches 100, I am going to reset it back down to zero. Call this the trend data. And now I'm going to add in our reset function. If our trend data is greater than or equal to, I'll say 101, then we are going to reset this number back down to zero. The reset numeric. Now we can head over to the data sampling and actually create a new data sampler to trend this value. This is where we're going to link in our different data sources or the different tags that we want to trend. So this first feed one is going to be my trend data. I can add in many more here, uh, but this is the only value that we're going to be actually measuring. Here on the right side, we're going to give this a directory because when we actually start and stop this process, it's going to be automatically exporting onto a CSV file. It'll be stored onto our SD card. So I'll call this our trend log or trend logs. And we can change the sampling interval here. This is how often that's actually going to be reading the values that I'm giving it from the trend data. And I will say this is gonna be very fast. Next, we can go to the HMI. And now we can start building in the graphing tools to display this value. 
and its history. So here in the toolbox, we can look for the trend. Place this down, and we'll make it nice and big. Down in the properties window, we have a lot of options for the different styles, what kind of data or trend we want to display. For this instance, we're just going to be defining the name and the x-axis time interval. I'm just going to say this is going to be two minutes. Now, even though this has a run button on the HMI variable or element, that doesn't necessarily start or stop the trending or sampling of our data. All this is going to do is pause whatever is currently being graphed, allow us to take screenshots with our buttons here up top, actually look at the XY coordination and see live values, or navigate through our different history or whatever curves are actually displayed. So this run button is not necessarily going to be starting and stopping our trending. That's going to be performed through the actual data sampler struct. Once we open up that struct, we have a start and sampling. And this is what we're going to use to turn on the data recording session. And we also have the create CSV bit. And this is going to be what allows the PLC to export our history onto the SD card once the trending has stopped. So I'm going to give this a power of value of one. So every time that we perform this, it's going to reset and synchronize with our SD card. I'm going to get the power of value of this to one as well. I'm also going to link this to a toggle button on our HMI. I'm actually going to give you a, a binary text variable. So we'll give this an action. When this is pressed, it is going to toggle the start end sampling. We're going to link this to the start end sampling. Oops. And we're going to change two different bin binary variables for this. So we'll say at the zero is stopped and one is running. Okay, so let's download this project right after I enable VNC. All right, now we're back from our coffee break. We'll reconnect. 
And we can see that it's already sampling our, our data. Value is incrementing up to 100 and then resetting immediately back down to zero. If I stop the trending, I can save a screenshot to the SD card. I can also scroll through the data to actually see the trend values. Because we have a high interval here, we actually need to scroll through quite a few times to actually get the updated values. If I select run, it will catch up and it will show us all the data that we've just missed. If I turn off the trending completely, the synchronizing process will finish. And now we have a CSV file stored onto our SD card. Just to confirm this, we can go to our offline mode. I'm gonna go through the Unistream management and the SD browser. This gives us uh, sort of a FTP communication between the PLC and Unilogic. And now I can go through and look for our SD or trend data. Oops, wrong folder. The samples, our trend logs, and then we have our history. And we've stopped our history. I have some uh, older files here from earlier, uh, but these files are readily available. I can export these, I can download them right now and view the different information that we've recorded through via our trend. Uh, so that's pretty much all I had to show for our local data logging options here. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. We'll try and uh, answer as many as we can. Just in the meantime, everybody will be getting a copy of this webinar emailed to them. So if you don't get that, please feel free to reach out, uh, but you should be getting that very soon. I'll be here for a few minutes here while we uh, get some questions rolling in. So feel free to add them to the chat. Um, if you do have any further questions, you can also email us, support at unitronics.com. Uh, we can also call us as well. I know there's a whole bunch of our, uh, this is a, a very brief introduction to a very vast topic. Um, so any questions you do have, we do have a help file articles. Um, and we're also here to answer your questions as well. Give me here for a little more here. So to take your time, if you do have questions, you can figure them out. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate you coming in here in the morning. Uh, Pedro, there is options for changing languages. Um, that would be going through the Uni apps. Uh, and there also is HMI functions for that. Um, but if you want to reach out to our support, we can send you some uh, examples of that as well as walkthroughs. So the HMI widgets for the data table index, uh, there's a question here on selecting more than one DTI. Um, so the DTI is going to be a static selection here um, from the other project file we had there. Let me try and open that up. So the actual widget itself is gonna be one data table showing. Uh, another quick question they see there about data being downloaded through the web server. Uh, absolutely. The PLC I have selected here actually does not have the web server functionality. It's not a pro series, um, but that can be downloaded through uh, the web server if it supports it. Um, we see a question about SQL with the Unilogic data synchronization. 
Uh, if you want to send that into uh, our support at unitronics.com, we can get you some information on the, you know, uh, the SQL data synchronization. Uh, you really do have to build out the query for that and then run through ladder the actual commands for the query. We do have the function blocks here in the ladder toolbox for read and write data tables. Uh, so just so I understand that question correctly about real time using a graphic control. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, is this uh, for using more than one widget on your HMI? Um, so actually, I don't believe there is a limitation on the number of widgets that you have on your HMI. Just to test that theory, I'll add a new data table. I'll link it to the same struct. I'll give it 10 rows. All right, so it's not pushing us back anything right now. I'm just gonna do a compile and make sure that it's okay. Yes, uh, data can be downloaded through the, uh, the web server. Oh, I'm sorry, that's another question. Uh, Marco, so if you're looking at uh, several data tables, let's see here. All right, yeah, so multiple displayed on the HMI is not a problem. Uh, but the data tables, you could have multiple running in your ladder. So if you are going to be pulling information, uh, then you can pull from multiple data tables at once in your project and feed that information to your PID control. Um, but if you want to reach out to us, uh, through our email, supportunitronics.com. We can take a look at your specific case, absolutely. Uh, so for SQL interface, uh, support at unitronics.com. Um, or you can go to our website, unitronicsplc.com. unitronicsplc.com. There is a contact support under the contact us. Uh, so I just got another question here about why we were really talking about FTP. Um, so any of the file formats that we're exporting here from our data samplings, our data tables, or our data tables, uh, any of these files that are being stored onto the SD card can now be transferred through an FTP server um, or received through the SD, FTP server onto the SD card. So you can change your recipes. Uh, you have access to them. Uh, data tables and data table recipes, those are a difference of, uh, of how they're being used, really. Uh, 32 gigs on the SD card. Yep, we recommend four to 32 gigs formatted to FAT32 settings. Um, we don't really have a particular recommendation for brand, but we do recommend brand name of good make.
All right, I'll give you guys another couple minutes here just to ask any left leftover questions you have. I'm going through them all now. Looks like I got through got through all of them. All right, well, uh, if you guys are still working on any questions, uh, just pass them along to our support. Uh, give us a call or support at unitronics.com. Thank you once again for joining us. I hope you all really enjoy your holidays, and I hope to hear from you guys really soon.